Uh, good evening, I'm Paul Thierman. I'm director of the library here at the New York Academy of Medicine and the Center for the History of Medicine and Public Health. So I wanna welcome you to tonight's program and to the Academy. And tonight's program, of course, is the 12th annual History of Medicine Night, six vignettes in the history of medicine presented by a wide variety of folks from around the country. Uh, first, I wanted to tell you just a little bit about the New York Academy of Medicine. Our vision is that everyone has the opportunity to live a healthy life. And our mission is that we is for improving health through attaining health equity with the goals of generating knowledge, changing systems, and engaging the public to ensure health for all. And could I have the next slide, please, Joey? I wanted to welcome you on behalf of the library and the Center for the History of Medicine. We work closely with the fellows section as we do tonight. The library was founded in 1847 at the very beginning of the founding of the Academy itself. It's been open to the public since um, 1878. Uh, although as matters now stand, it's open to the public when COVID ends enough for all of us to come back. Um, we have extensive collections in, the, in medicine and public health uh, focused around the history. Uh, 550,000 volumes, including a rare book collection of 32,000 volumes, 275 portraits and illustrations, 400,000 pamphlets, manuscripts, archives, a whole variety of other materials. Now, during uh, the COVID pandemic, we have pushed out even more strongly online and virtually. So we have an active digital program with 18 digital collections online, including some of our oldest items and our most recent collection of 11 manuscript cookbooks from the 17th to the 19th centuries. Uh, we do online events, including two recent lectures, one on manuscript cookbooks and one on the physician sisters of Elizabeth and Emily Blackwell. Uh, we're producing video virtual, sorry, virtual visits on video, seven so far. The most recent in February was on chocolate. We have an e-newsletter and you can always phone us or email us to uh, find out more or look at niam.org slash library. So a little bit of housekeeping. If you have a question you'd like to answer, uh, uh, like to ask, we encourage you to ask your questions by entering them into the box at the bottom marked Q&A. Click at the icon at the bottom of your screen and type in your collection and uh, we'll answer as many questions as time allows. And for those guests who would like to enable closed captioning, please click on the icon at the bottom of your screen labeled CC. A live transcript will appear in your feed. And to in introduce our speakers and the rest of the events this evening, I want to welcome the chair of the New York Academy of Medicine section on the history of medicine and public health, Dr. Robert Rubin, thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you very much, Paul, and it's a pleasure to be here. And good evening all, and welcome to the 12th Annual History of Medicine Night. This evening, our speakers will be presenting uh, from topics from around, concerning the history of health disparities and pandemics. We have speakers as far away as Omaha, thanks to COVID, and, and Zoom. First and foremost, just some house, one housekeeping rule. We've scheduled this for 12 minutes for presentation and three minutes for question and answer. We have a long program because we had so many uh, very excellent uh, presentations. So please respect the times and I'll let you know about a minute or two before your time is up. Now to start us off this evening, please welcome Dr. Yaming Cheng, president of the College of Chinese Medicine, who will be presenting quotes, Dake, unquotes, quotes, a Chinese herbalist who combated the 1918 influenza pandemic in America. Dr. Chen. Thank you, Dr. Rubin. And uh, can I have a slide, please? I'm so honored to be invited to present an amazing story about a Chinese herbalist and combating the 1918 to 1919 influenza pandemic in the United States. So the story about 100 years ago in the, in the far west in the uh, Oregon, in a small town called Jiang Bay. And, uh, 
the herbal the herbal uh, shop is called uh, Kenwa Chang uh, in the building. So now is the uh, state park of Oregon and also national historic landmark. So the all the stuff and the goods and the herbs are still being kept in that building and uh, as a museum right now, but uh, it's too far away. And <laughs> we think in the winter they close, in the summertime they open, but uh, during pandemic, they also close. Can I see the slides? I don't see the slides. Laura's working on it. Okay. Laura, do you want me to share the screen? Yeah, share screen, thank you. Okay, great. Yes, Casey, thank you. Okay, go back to the first one. Thank you. Okay, second, uh, next, please. Yeah. So the story is the about the uh, Dr. Ying Hei and uh, his real Chinese name is Yu Nian, and because they came from Canton, the Tuisan. So Tuisanese pronunciation is different. And so it's the Ying Hei, but they all call him Dr. Hei. Next slide, please. So as you know, in the middle of the 19th century, thousands of thousands of Chinese labor came to United States and for gold rush and later for railroad construction. So a lot of uh, <coughs> Chinese early settlers came to this country and uh, Ying He is, was one of them, but uh, he came late, I think. Uh, the, almost done with the, uh, the gold rush and also the railroad construction. And also I think the Chinese Exclusion Act already passed in 1982. And he came with his father and uh, five uncles. So all came, to, uh, came from a small county in Canton. It took a couple of months to ship to the United States. And uh, first, next slide, please. First, he went to uh, the, Sea uh, the Washington state, it's called the Walla Walla. That's the, in the right up corner. So it's a far distant area. You probably know a lot of China, uh, Chinatowns in New York City, in San Francisco, in Los Angeles, in Portland, but uh, actually, during that time, a lot of Chinatowns in the, all those distant places. So Walla Walla was one of them. And I believe at that time, a lot of 1,000 Chinese settled there. So three years later, his father returned to China and he stayed and moved to uh, Jiang Dei. That's the, in the bottom, the circle, you can see the Jiang Dei. Uh, Right now, still uh, about a five hours driving from Jiangdei to Portland, and uh, it's the Grand County. So the left corner, you see the big circle, that's the uh, Jiangdei area. And uh, below there is a small one called uh, Kenyon City. So Kenyon City is up to the mountain. Uh, before uh, Inghe arrived, they have a big fire in Kenyon, uh, Kenyon City. So it's a lots of Chinese community. Uh, later they moved to lower place that called Jiang Dei. You see the picture over there. Right now still the town is uh, 1600 people over there right now and uh, still far distant. So, and then later, <clears throat> a lot of Chinese people left because the construction, build constru uh, railroad construction is done, but the uh, Inhe still stayed there. Next slide, please. So around 1888, Inhe and his business partner, Luan, purchased that building called, and, uh, called uh, Ken Wa Chong. So Ken is golden. Uh, Wa is the uh, 
big number. Chong is the prosperity. So it is a good luck for the, this name. And uh, the Luang is a very smart person, educated, and uh, also is a very good mind for the business mind. So two of them operated this uh, clinic. Also, not only the clinic could be the local Chinese community. And uh, so the center of the gathering and they provide a lot of herbs. So you probably see so early, they do have a <coughs> herb practice in the United States. The answer, yes. So the written record show the earliest time for the trading of the material medica, this kind of Chinese herb to the United States in the late colonial time. So it's late 18, uh, <coughs> 18,000, yeah, 18th century, sorry, 18th century. Uh, one article discovered in 1850, 1850 in San Francisco, the, Ch the Chinese, Chinatown area has a 15 herbal store. So it's not uh, <laughs> surprising. And uh, Ying He opened his the herbal store in 1888. So he practiced there until 1948, he retired. Next slide, please. <clears throat> so he almost practiced 60 years over there. So also has some kind of trouble because at that time people sue him for uh, non-license, right? <laughs> illegal practice, but all three cases dismissed all the community people and the witness and say a good result, the judge dismissed the three cases. The story about the 1918-1919 influenza pandemic, it's the, uh, is a disaster a hundred years ago and uh, almost uh, the worldwide uh, five mil million, yeah, five million people died in the United States I think the figure is 556,000 people passed away. So this COVID-19 pandemic, I think two weeks ago, half a million people passed away. So I think the figure probably was more than that. So the, on the left, you can see the poster of the, at that time, so they recommend people wear the mask, but the mask seems a little bit different from us, right? Two layers <laughs> and uh, keep the mustache you can see that it was probably the nose can still uh, breathing and, uh, for fresh air. <laughs> it's not a, uh, the screen. But anyway, uh, the time to United States probably in the fall 1918 and uh, to the winter. So the hit is hottest uh, population is young adults. So about of under 40, those age of people, the severe impact by the inspection complications and the death. So whatever in the urban area or rural areas, they all <coughs> very severe. So in Oregon also, uh, the death certificate held a fine of thousands people died because of influenza from 1918 to 1919. The next slide, please. So in John Day, uh, in the Eastern Oregon, I think at that time, the Grand County, they uh, built a highway, highway connect to uh, Portland. So it's very critical because of budgeting issue. And uh, if the railroad, uh, the, not railroad, the highway is not, uh, the project not completed in the winter and the next coming is the spring season. So spring is a raining season. So it's a lot of money. So it's very complicated and their budget almost exhausted. So at that time, also over there, very cold. And the record in that book, China Data of John Day by Jeffrey Barrows and Christine uh, Richardson. And uh, say at that time, the record of the temperature is minus 27. So very cold area, but they are doing uh, those Chinese labor doing did the work and uh, very hard, very hard. 
So the pandemic time, even the, the severe threat to this project. And uh, next slide, please. So <clears throat> Dr. Hay and uh, try his best and uh, make the herbal formula. And according to his experience, and uh, also he cooked by himself. And his partner, Luan, drove out to the work camp with hay and with the medicine. And uh, it's about uh, gallons of those bitter herbal mixture. So it tastes very bad. They say the bitter uh, brew, a bitter brew. So, and uh, they brought to the site of the, they are working. And also they warmed over stove in the crude shelter of the road coast. And those people all drink those kind of the, uh, the herbal decoctions and uh, even the smell terrible and taste bad. Next slide, please. Two minutes left, Dr. Chen. Okay, so they all not only treat the Chinese community and also a lot of uh, the non-Chinese people. And uh, so it's very successful. You can see in the book, a lot of the uh, letters and uh, also you can see the picture show the, uh, the area of practice, the people coming is more than the local area. Next slide, please. Yeah, they also use Gua Sha, but they have a picture I've made of this. Next slide, please. So the outcome is very promising. And uh, those people he treated, and none of them uh, died. And also none of them become the buried and, and they all continue to work. And uh, the highway is complete on time, the project on time. And a lot of resource can show this. Next slide, please. Yeah, that's also sure, but the, it says 1919, 1920, probably the time is different. So it should be 1918, 1919. Next slide, please. So in 2018, they have a special exhibition in the New York City, the Museum of Chinese American. And uh, also they brought a certain piece of the uh, display to New York City. And uh, our college is one of the uh, sponsor. Next slide, please. Yeah, there's an article about this I published last year. Thank you very much. And I have any question, please let me know. <laughs> Laura, can you read the questions? If anyone has any questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A box. You should see an icon to speech balloons at the bottom of your screen that says Q&A. Please feel free to type them in there. Okay, thank you very much. Um, someone would like to know, are many of these bitter herbs currently regularly used in practice for similar purposes today? Yes, okay, so until 2016, uh, okay, nationwide have the 26 states allow the Chinese herbal medicine being practiced under the licensed acupuncture uh, uh, practice scope. So until 2016, those uh, the, the herbs are in the legally in the practice scope of licensed acupuncturists. Mm -hmm. But uh, they are in the category of the uh, the dietary supplements. So we have been very careful for the wording. We cannot cure, treat, prevent, mitigate. And, uh, but the, the reality is for the symptom management is, is very good yeah, right now. Any other questions, Laura? There, are, there do not appear to be any other questions. Last call for questions. Okay. All right, thank okay. you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, it's really very interesting. And we'll go to our next speaker, the presentation uh, by uh, Dr. Beverly.
patient engagement and cultural competence specialist, New York Academy of Medicine fellow, and collaborator with the Medical Society of the State of New York and the Institute of Health Improvement, Health Disparities and Epidemics, Perception versus Reality, with questions to be answered by the co-author, Dr. Augustine Umenzo, Director of Behavioral Medical Services, New York City Health and Hospital, Kings County, New York. Please begin, Dr. Beverly. Thank you, Dr. Rubin. Um, I'm honored to be a speaker with Dr. Augustine Umizor at NIAM's 12th Annual History of Medical Event. And as you see, our presentation is entitled Health Disparities and Epidemics, Perception versus Reality. Next slide, please. So the, just a history of health disparities. Harriet Washington's critically acclaimed book, Medical Apartheid, the dark history of medical experimentation on Black Americans traces medical experimentation on Black Americans going back to the middle of the 18th century, culminating with the telling of the infamous Tuskegee experiment in which African Americans suffered from syphilis were denied an available cure in order to trace the course of the disease. In her best-selling book, Just, Just Medicine, A Cure of Racial Inequality in the American Healthcare, Attorney Dana Bowen Matthew proposed that the cure for racial and ethnic discrimination in the American healthcare lies in reform in the Civil Rights Act of 1964. Add to this, there are more books and numerous scholarly articles detailing historical racial accounts and the need for policy changes, all of which paints a very compelling picture. What I'm gonna focus on is the absence of the individual human value. It eliminates or diminishes the, patient, the need for patient engagement. And resolving this absence can lead to better health outcomes for African-Americans of all socioeconomic status. Next slide, please. So we wanna be able to eradicate misperceptions and fallacies. So let's look at the concept of the perception versus reality. Next slide. So the COVID pandemic has shed a bright light on the longstanding numerous health inequalities experienced by Black Americans across the US. The Black population has the highest COVID-19 death rate. The perception is the prevailing thought is that it's a result of poverty, lack of access to care, social determinants of health and comorbidities. So here's the reality. So for example, in Prince George County in Maryland, one of the wealthiest black upper-class communities in the nation has some of the highest COVID mortalities. Brooklyn, New York, with a large black population has 13 hospitals, three public, one state, and extensive public transportation has the highest COVID associated death in New York City. Public transportation employees who died were, pre were predominantly black, there were union employers, employees, sorry. Um, the, the average salary was approximately 50,000. They had pensions and they had health coverage. So we still see stark racial differences even at high income levels, said Tanjala Purnell, Associate Director of Johns Hopkins Center of Health Equity. People say, oh, minorities are dying because they are poor. We know that's not the case. Next. So, we, so how do we look to decrease health disparities? And I think that we may want to look at solutions that are, some solutions are simple as they are complex. What do I mean by that? So the recommendations for health systems culture change. The required first step to decrease healthcare inequities is to increase human value. It is important to recognize and address the role of cultural competence for all populations, as currently the English speaking population is left out of the conversation. And so we also want to hear from the patient's voices. So here's a statement from a patient. An elderly African-American woman states, all I want when I go to a hospital is for someone to be nice to me. Next. Next. Another African-American woman, elderly African-American woman states, I picked cotton in the South and I paid my dues. I don't deserve to be treated this way. These powerful quotes are saying, do you know me? My historical background, my pain and my suffering. Do 
you possess the level of cultural competence to understand who I am and what's important to me. How are you going to express empathy and engage me in order to improve my health? Next. So I think some of the simple solution is what I determined to be a bi-directional approach. So patient engagement and cultural competence must have this, a bi-directional approach. The foreign, there's foreign medical graduates to American patients, and there's American born physicians to foreign patients. And there are, needs to be an American born physician to American born patients who are different than themselves. So if we are able to understand and be culturally competent from the foreign medical graduates to American patients, American born physicians to foreign born patients and American born physicians to American born patients who are different, different than themselves, we could start on the road to decrease in health inequities. So if we know who the individual is as opposed to one's perception of the individual, then the is the same as the reality then there is an opportunity to make needed changes. But if one's perception is different than the reality, then we run the risk of increasing disparities in care and as a result, poor health outcomes. Next. So these are just some memorable quotes that is really so pertinent for our, our space right now in terms of identifying health inequities. Martin Luther King Jr. spoke at a medical committee for human rights in 1966, and he stated, of all the forms of inequality, injustice in healthcare is the most shocking and inhumane. And this is from um, Dr. William Zemsky, uh, in terms of an article, Fostering Trust and Justice. Difficult patients are not just born. They are in part created by their passage through the medical system. Not only has the system failed to cure, it may have done unpleasant things to make matters worse. And he was referring to the treatment for sickle cell patients. And Hippocrates, it's better to know the individual who has the disease than the disease who has the individual. Interestingly, he, Hippocrates, knew that thousands of years ago and we are just learning that now. Um, next, thank you. Um, I'm going to turn this over now to Dr. Yuma Zor for the Q&A um, part of the presentation. Thank you. Thank you. And if anyone has any questions, this is just a reminder to please enter them in the Q&A box. Thank you. Don't see any questions. Does uh, just a last one last call for questions, please? Okay. All right. If there um, are no questions, I, I, think I, I have a question for Dr. Beverly. Is here? Uh, I want to ask Mr. One thing that's come to attention is some that some members of the African American community uh, are refusing, or at least saying at this point, they don't want to take the vaccination. Could you comment on this? Yes, I would. As a matter of fact, you know, it's been an ongoing conversation with colleagues of mine. I think, again, the perception is that the African-American community don't want to take the vaccine because of their knowledge and their experience, Tuskegee. And I really do believe that's a part of it. But that's more of an age-related concern because I've developed a survey based on age from 19 years old to 30 to 31 to 50 to 51 to 65 and over 65. And what we are trying to do with the survey um, is to try to understand is the 19-year-old who may be suspicious about not, or, or decided they're not sure about taking the vaccine, is it because of Tuskegee or there is another reason for it? And what we are finding is that um, Tuskegee doesn't seem to be 
in the younger generation as a reason for it. Uh, some of the concern, and it's also been a lot of articles written on it, is some of the concern is that um, it may have been developed too fast, or they want to wait and see, you know, how is it going to pan out? And I think it's just important, and again, it goes with the perception, is to expand the conversation across all age groups in the African-American community. And then if you look at the top three reasons now, then we could really create a program and a process that will benefit all. Thank you. Well, we have uh, a couple of questions that have come up. The first one, um, we would like, uh, Dr. Epstein would like to ask what you think, phys uh, what you think can be done to educate the next generation of physicians? Um, yeah, uh, Moba, I can start, you can just jump in. Yeah, I, I think, you know, this well-documented, you know, um, this health disparity, inequity, perception versus reality. I think the, the, the first thing we need to do is, you know, it's been acknowledged, there has been studies, it has to be um, in terms of the curriculum and the education. Um, it has to be included in the curriculum and education of the uh, next generation, and then understanding why this has happened, and then we can go from there. Moba, if you have anything to add. Uh, Moba? Yes. No, I, I think um, in terms of the next generation, are you, is the question related to physicians or clinical teams or to, to the public? What can be done to educate the next generation of physicians? Physician, I think it's really important to, um, to eliminate and, and focus on certain languages. Get rid of the word from my perspective, drug seekers in describing sickle cell patients. And when you use the word, I'm sure we have heard the word non-compliant. We heard that you know, 10 times a day. But when I do surveys, not many people know the reason why. So I think it will be important in training that if you're going to use the word non-compliant, it is important to ask the patient and the family, why? Why didn't you follow directions? Because if you don't do that and you end up being non-compliant and it's in your medical records, you know, three, three times you're on the help bus. And I think the other thing to point out is cultural competence has to be across all populations. And the English speaking population, particularly the elderly black population, to me who has gone through the atrocities that they had to endure and they're still alive and they have the worst health outcomes, it would be important to understand them from a cultural perspective and look at, and also look at the role of religion in all populations, because that pays a major part in how people respond to to their health, um, to their to their diagnosis and 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 healthcare, and just the last thing, there's a common thread: the human experience. Once accurately diagnosed, no human being could give it back. So maybe we could create a more empathetic environment than uh, a judgmental one. Question to Dr. Beverly: Is there a concerted? program to inform the elderly population of African Americans concerning the utility of the vaccine, because they are, as far as we know, uh, or anything as most venerable. I'm an 87, so I'm <laughs> hideously aware of this, and I'm really concerned that this segment of the population uh, should at least be have information made available to them so they can make choices. Um, yeah, I think the availability is the main problem because when people say people don't want to take vaccine, if they're not accessible and they're not available, then the issue with jumping, you know, putting the, the horse before the carriage, mm -hmm. get the vaccines to that community and look at the people in the community was influence of the physicians in the hospitals, the, the community um, um, organizations, the church. You know, I think, but first you have to get the vaccines to that population. And so far that's the major problem. They're not getting it. 
And I think it would be helpful, particularly for the elderly black population to uh, Johnson and Johnson, the one dose, the one dose would be fine because then you won't have to wait in line 10 hours. You don't for an elderly person to wait in line for 10 hours. It makes no sense. Even, even two hours or one yeah, hour. Even, <laughs> exactly. I know. <laughs> so the one shot would be very helpful. And so that's something I'm working with, with the National Medical Association to look at how we could, um, you know, increase the amount of um, vaccines to minority communities across the board and to any community period. I, I think our clock has run out and I'd like to thank both uh, <coughs> uh, Drs. Beverly and uh, Dr. DeMazo for really a very useful and interesting and productive presentation. It was a pleasure. And now we would go on to our thank next you. speaker, Dr. Gerald Fitzgerald, who is a public health and environmental historian. He is currently a visiting scholar in the Department of History of Medicine and Art History at George Mason University in Virginia. This presentation is part of the first chapter of a longer book project entitled, Turn on the Light, Airborne Disease Control in the United States, 1930 to 1965. Dr. Fitzgerald, it's all yours. Thank you, can you hear me? I can. Oh, good, okay. I'd like to thank the uh, fine folks at the New York Academy of Medicine for allowing me to speak tonight. Uh, this first photograph is probably taken by 1937 at William uh, Wells's laboratory at the University of Pennsylvania at the medical school. In these early winter months of 2021, we are living at the, in the age of the COVID-19 pandemic. Across the nation and around the world, biomedical scientists, physicians, public health specialists, and engineers are working frantically to contain the airborne spread of COVID-19. The work they are carrying out is in many cases based upon decades of early research by an older generation of multidisciplinary airborne disease specialists. While most people outside of medicine and public health have given little thought to airborne disease until the onset of this global outbreak, airborne disease study and airborne disease containment protocols and technologies are not a 21st century invention. Serious scientific research on the phenomenon of airborne disease and airborne infection was an exciting if little known part of public health research in the United States beginning in the 1930s. One person who made significant contributions to the field of airborne disease research was William Firth Wells a public health engineer who spent the majority of his academic career at the laboratory for the study of airborne infection at the University of Pennsylvania Medical School, including his career at the School of Public Health at Johns Hopkins. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in my brief presentation tonight, I will discuss Wells' invention of the air centrifuge and his discovery of, discovery of droplet nuclei in the early 1930s, both of which helped lay the biomedical foundation for our understanding of droplet airborne-based disease spread today a topic that has been central to our understanding of COVID spread and has been on the front page of newspapers around the world since this time last year. Now Wells, who was not trained as a physician but was trained as a sanitary engineer, was exposed to the cutting edge research of his day, work that focused primarily on water-based purification systems for urban and rural public health. Wells appropriated the water-centric paradigm and applied it to the air in an effort to discover and hopefully contain air-based microbial and viral modes of infection. As a, result, as a result of his early work with the air centrifuge and the subsequent discovery of droplet nuclei in 1933, Wells' multifaceted research became useful to numerous practitioners in the new field of intramural aerobiology or the air microbiology of the built environment. Now, some background. William Firth Wells matriculated into the Department of Biology at MIT, where he studied sanitary engineering, graduating in 1910. At the time, two of the leading sanitary bacteriologists in the United States, William T. Sedgwick and CEA, CEA Winslow guided MIT's program. Wells training at MIT emphasized a rigorous, integrated and quantitative approach to sanitary bacteriology and engineering research that was unique within the United States at that time and reflected the, the division of the department's founder, Professor Sedgwick. The program was also at this time split and students like Wells could receive training both at MIT and the public health program at the Harvard Medical School. Cedric saw the field of public health as not only involving physicians, biologists, chemists, and engineers, but also including architects, physicists, geologists, and other specialists who might bring expertise to a problem that could impact the health and well being of human populations. This type of multidisciplinary approach to research advocated by Cedric were academic boundaries between departments and schools of biology, sanitary engineering, architecture, public health, or medicine were seen as porous, and research was defined by how the problem could be solved, not by who posed the question, uh, provided a roadmap for Wells when he followed his entire career. This is a shot in the basement of this uh, the Harvard Medical School 
uh, taking around uh, the time. But this is actually interesting enough was a device used for chemical warfare research during World War I, which Wells reincorporated into public health research, uh, actually bleeding plowshares from a sword. Uh, next slide, please. Um, in January 1933, Wells published a paper in the American Journal of Public Health entitled Apparatus for the Study of Bacterial Behavior of Air. At the time, Wells was an instructor of sanitary science in the Harvard School of Public Health Department of Industrial Hygiene. In this paper, Wells described the new instrument that he developed for determining the bacterial content of air, the air centrifuge. Operating somewhat in the manner of a milk clarifier, this instrument allowed investigators to sample the air for bacteria while simultaneously depositing the organisms on a collection medium thus eliminating the need for separate plating. Replying, re relying upon the principles of centrifugal separation, the air centrifuge created and measured airflow from a given lo location, collected bacterial samples from the air, and finally deposited the bacteria into a glass container lined with growth media, ready transportation back to the laboratory for counting. More importantly, the air centrifuge collected minute, atomatized airborne material that wells Christian droplet nuclei. No other instrument was capable of this type of sampling. Wells argued that the instrument greatly simplified tests of atmospheric reservoirs, conditioning equipment, and bacterial sources for aerial contamination. The air centrifuge sampled airborne bacteria more efficiently than other available instrumentation and did so without damaging the organism. Wells' goal in designing, building, and testing the air centrifuge was to develop a portable instrument so bacteriologists and sanitary engineers could quantify and analyze the bacterial content of air in the same way they analyzed water. I will note that air airborne bacteria are very delicate and difficult to capture, and the air centrifuge allowed researchers to suck in airborne dust motes on which airborne bacteria are riding for, for capture and identification. It's basically a sort of modified vacuum cleaner. Now, while this research soon caught the attention of a broader audience, and it was featured in a January 1937 issue of Collier's Magazine in an article called Turn on the Light. By this time, Wells had expanded his biomedical research toolkit to include using ultraviolet radiation, which you saw on the first page, as a tool to probe the mysteries of airborne bacteria and viruses. The Collier's article, written by J.D. Radcliffe, wittily encapsulated Wells' laboratory work to elucidate and contain airborne disease through a jury-rigged sneezing machine, using combination with a new form of experimental lamp inviting, emitting UV radiation. The Collier's article also explained to a light audience many of the important features of his earlier work on droplet nuclei from 1933 and 1934, Putting his historical work, uh, putting his work in historical perspective. Next slide, please. Um, Wells's research at this time was an approach extending and expanding the earlier research of the 19th century German bacteriologist and hygienist Karl Fluge. Fluge had studied the biophysics and aerodynamics and possible infectious nature of airborne droplets. In his laboratory, Fluge had studied airborne infection by instructing volunteers to sneeze on glass slides lined with sterile gelatins that could be later incubated and studied to search for infectious microorganisms. In the course of his work, Fluga plotted the downward parabolic airborne flight path of those droplets of water released by the human nose during a sneeze. According to Fluga's meticulous research, larger and heavier droplets fell to the ground uh, quickly due to gravitational forces, but questions remained about the possible existence of lighter, smaller droplets that might drift on air currents much farther than their larger cousins. Uh, next slide, please. Um, now, Wells was especially interested in these lighter dried particles. With the creation of the air centrifuge, he was able to capture these lighter dried particles and study how quickly they dried, how fast they fell to the ground due to gravitational forces, and more importantly, the impact of humidity on the process of drying and falling times. He began publishing papers in this topic in 1933, published papers through 1934, and the differences between these large and small particles, or droplets, a lot of which he, he christened droplet nuclei. Um, Wells would spend uh, 1936 and uh, 1937 uh, studying the impact of water vapor and humidification on bacterial infections and sanitary conditions in uh, textile mills in New England. This would provide additional uh, data on intricacies of how water, air, and humidity impacted microbial movements within the air. Um, in his 1933 paper, uh, The Apparatus for the Study of Bacterial Behavior of Air, Wells not only described the instrumental characteristics of the air centrifuge, but he also explained uh, how this instrument was an essential tool in a new research program in air bacteriology. He noted the following, quote, quantitative examination of water for non-pathogenic bacteria has become a vital factor in the design, operation, and control of water supply systems, and sanitary control of streams, bathing places, and shellfish grounds. If, if air bacteriology in a similar way is to determine in the future the hygienic characteristics of air supply and conditioning systems, it becomes necessary because of the wide variability of bacterial results 
to accumulate more extensive data than are presently available. This necessitates the development of a convenient method which observers will obtain through compar will obtain comparable results. Now, when introducing the centrifuge against the backdrop of an earlier successful research program in the sanitary analysis of water supply systems, Wells constructed a model for bringing similar instrumental and standardization methodologies to air supply systems. Um, while correct, it would take many years before his theories would gain widespread acceptance in the public health community. Uh, next slide, please. Um, now to conclude, this, these are actually shots of Wells's uh, laboratory, and this is a shot of the Phipps Institute at, at the Penn uh, Medical School in the 1930s. Um, now to conclude, <clears throat> William Firth Wells would spend the rest of his life until the early 1960s working on airborne disease research. He began his approach to airborne disease with a sanitary engineer's toolkit, appropriating the water-based purification paradigm of his early 20th century MIT training, looking into the various technologies installed to keep urban populations free of water-based illness, and he used these models as a guide to attempt to control air-based microbial and viral sources of illness and disease in a similar manner. As a result of his early work with the air centrifuge and the subsequent discovery of droplet nuclei in 1933, Wells's multifaceted research became useful to numerous practitioners within the new field of aerobiology. While he's little known today outside of those who study the biophysics and epidemiology of airborne infection, his research and engineering approaches to public health instrumentation and modeling in the late interwar period provided a foundation for work in airborne disease, airborne infection, and perhaps more importantly, airborne infection prevention that is still studied and cited by disease specialists today. Uh, next slide, and thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Fitzgerald. I uh, will now take questions from the audience. Uh, Laura, if you wanna be the question answer. Thank you. In, in some way, Wells' ideas seem to derive from the famous work of John Tyndall with the addition of more G-forces of a centrifuge. Did he see his work related to Tyndall? And likewise, did Wells see the sedimentation theories of Svedberg as relevant? Uh, not Svedberg, but actually Wells was a big fan of Tyndall. I actually have, have a section in that chapter on Tyndall. Tyndall uh, Wells was very, was very much aware of Tyndall's research, actually, in, in Great Britain. I mean, he actually drew a little bit also on Pasteur's research on uh, taking aerial samples earlier in the, 19, in the late 19th century. So. Are there any other questions from the audience? Yes, I would have one, Dr. Fitzgerald. Um, I guess now with COVID, his work has been more than applied. Could you comment now on what the current technology is in looking at uh, the viral dispersion? He was looking at just bacteria. Um, there's actually, uh, the National Academy of Sciences had, a, had a, um, a, a workshop in the summer, I guess it was in July, where they, the first section of that workshop was on airborne disease biophysics. And uh, of the six speakers, four of them actually mentioned Wells directly. Um, Lindia Borabia's laboratory at MIT is actually basically taking Wells' research to the next level, looking at fluid dynamics and basically most, um, and looking at aerosol and turbulence levels of research. Um, Wells' research was sort of limited to instrumentation that was available in the 1930s, up through even to the 1960s. Um, researchers today at MIT, at the University of Maryland, at Virginia Tech are doing some really pathbreaking stuff, taking it up to, to a different level, looking more at fluid dynamics models, actually. Um, Wells was actually essentially right, but it took a lot of it took a long time for people to be convinced of, of the the, uh, the the essential nature of his research and how right he was at the time. Um, in fact, he actually doesn't really prove his his research until he's, he does his last experiment at Hopkins in 1963. Actually, he actually dies during during his last experiment, sadly, at the at, at the School of Public Health, actually. Um, but he actually does then prove that tuberculosis is airborne, which is which you would have been happy to know that that actually did make the textbook. I, my question was. Uh, what are people doing about airborne viruses? These are all bacteria. Well, no, they're doing both. I'm not really an expert on viruses per, per se, except for, um, I don't look at stuff past the 1940s, so I'm not actually sure what's going on right okay. now. So. <laughs> Laura, any other questions? Um, no, no questions. Thank you. Okay, well, we'll go on to the next. We have a slight change in the order of program, people. Uh, Dr. No has requested to be the last speaker. So Ms. Farman, if you have no objections, uh, you would uh, follow the speaker after this, if that's okay with everybody. Oh, that's the Wells article, thanks. Was that okay with you? Yep. Yes? Yes, it is okay. 
Okay, good. So, well, then let me introduce the fourth speaker. Our next uh, speaker is Kodash Zumaladova, a PhD student in the Department of Sciences, Technology, and Society, will be presenting Vector Biology Network, bringing innovations in modern biology to the field of vector-borne disease. A good way to follow Dr. Fitzgerald's lecture. Dr. Zumala, you have the floor. Good evening. Uh, it's a big honor to present my ideas to you today. Uh, can we get my slides, please? Yes, thank you. Um, um, next slide. So perhaps by now you have seen um, in the press or in general discourse that um, and have heard about the gene drive technology. And especially in the light of the recent Nobel Prize in chemistry for the development of CRISPR technology, the, the public discussion resurfaced. But just to remind you that the gene drive technology can allow us to change gene frequency in a population. And it's been proposed to uh, genetically engineer mosquitoes um, so that um, eventually we can eliminate mosquitoes that, um, that carry vector-borne diseases. So the initial question that motivated my study is that what brought those molecular biology techniques uh, to the field of vector-borne disease, uh, diseases? And by molecular biology, I mean techniques that manipulate genetic material. Next slide, please. So uh, to partially answer this question, uh, we can look at the history of Vector Biology Network. Vector Biology Network was a collaborative research network uh, that was um, born out of a bigger parasite biology consortium. So um, some group of scientists proposed um, yeah, to MacArthur Foundation to create uh, and to fund uh, such network was the purpose of bringing molecular biology techniques to the field. And uh, I like, um, it was interesting for me to look at this problem because it seems that this institution, this organization was transient. It acted on, it was active only for a decade, but during this decade, they, were ma they managed to create invisible network and infrastructure that's still alive today. Also, the network was um, dispersed, so the participant laboratories were different institutions, uh, mainly in the US, but also one in Europe, in Crete. So uh, although, and I also like the idea that consortia and networks, they emphasize collaboration between researchers rather than um, competition. So as a result of a decade of work, um, researchers managed to create a first transgenic mosquito. They also um, created a strategy that allowed um, 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 sequencing of genome of the anophilanes um, family uh, later on. And just to remind you that this decade is a decade of a human genome project. So genome sequencing was a really a buzz Word. They also created a molecular data for um, vector immunity and um, chromosomal maps. So it was beneficial to study uh, vectors from molecular biology uh, point of view. But what is more interesting to me as a STS scholar is to look how this transient um, organization created um, uh, a new generation of scientists and personnel that was able to propagate field further to these days. Uh, next slide, please. Um, this slide, uh, this histogram demonstrates um, um, publication outcome. As you see, the vector biology network really allowed the field of molecular vector um, studies to boom. But again, I just, just want to emphasize that I'm more interested in invisible networks that uh, this organization allowed. And also, uh, I want to situate the vector biology network in the larger um, landscape of global health. And I also picked a few topics that I want to emphasize um, um, during my discussion. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the first thing that I think is important to bear in mind and discuss is the role of philanthropy in the global health. And to start the discussion, we really should go back to the pioneering uh, Rockefeller Foundation that in 1914 uh, already had an international health board that was um, 
that went on a global scale with its um, lessons learned from hookworm uh, worm eradication campaign in the American South. So in the 10 year period, Rockefeller Foundation reached 52 countries and 29 islands. And this first initial efforts on the global health uh, emphasized uh, really work with community and um, education uh, on the disease prevention. Also, um, work with local municipalities uh, on um, disease prevention. And as we see, as the um, philanthropy on the global scale progresses, it seems that um, the emphasis is shift towards research on the diseases. So in particular, they focused on the yellow fever and malaria, and later on, uh, MacArthur Foundation and today Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation seems to continue this line. So uh, what I would argue when we analyze the role of philanthropies, it's important to look back because it seems that the, uh, the current one picks where the previous one uh, is left out. And it seems that all those um, uh, networks that um, this um, activity creates, they sort of, it's self-propagating. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, I also just want to briefly mention that um, we, sh we should not uh, forget that um, the study of tropical diseases has uh, a colonial origin. Uh, and again, we see a philanthropy money here. For example, the one of the first schools that uh, um, studies um, tropical diseases was uh, created on the money by uh, Sir Alfred Jones, who was a, a, sh a, sh a sh shipper at the Liverpool port. And um, yeah, and other um, European governments, um, um, colonial governments were also interested in creating. But what I want to argue, and again, you can, yeah, <laughs> um, argue against that point is that uh, I, as I analyze the history of Liverpool School, it seems that by the mid 20th century, they really go south. They realize that they need to do work uh, with the communities. They, uh, they start to teach at the universities and open laboratories in Africa and Latin America. But uh, it seems that now the trend is reversed and more than philanthropies emphasize technological solutions uh, like uh, CRISPR edited mosquitoes. And I think it um, reduces the countries, the recipient countries as mere consumers and not, uh, it does not create the networks and infrastructures that would uh, be more beneficial in the long term. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, um, in my short uh, presentation, I just wanted to uh, emphasize a few points, such as um, Vector Biology Network really allows us to look at the mechanics and logistics of uh, current um, commercialized science that really needs uh, institutional effort to bring uh, innovations or like any impact to the world. And it also requires a lot of funding. And uh, yeah, maybe a few insights on the philanthropic capitalism of today's global health um, can be drawn from my presentation. And the last and not the least, I think the COVID recent COVID pandemic really sort of solidified the narrative of emerging diseases coming from the global south. Although maybe to challenge this, we, can, we should remember the colonial uh, origins of like global health and um, really see that the information flows unidirectionally, uh, unidirectionally from global north to global south. And maybe there, there we should challenge um, this view, like, um, what, like why this pandemic happens in the first place. So again, I would be glad to hear your questions, concerns, and uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Are there any questions, Laura? I would have one to begin with. Um, how did these laboratories uh, interact with what else was going on during the colonial period? The uh, rather the horrible labor practices of uh, what was really kind of almost genocide in many places. So. Uh, it's kind of, you know, a Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde. Do you hear me comment? Do you know anything about how they interacted with this, especially? I saw we had one from Belgium, uh, England, Germany. Uh, could you yeah. comment on that? 
Yeah, thank you for your question. So I mostly focused on like institutionalization of the study when like the special institutions were created to study. But it seems that um, the doctors beginning from like um, 19th century, mid centuries, they were uh, really going there and trying to um, so the initial effort to study was not because of like the um, effort to cure the local population, but mostly port cities in European, European port cities were interested in like preventing the disease in uh, sailors that would come. So, uh, and I think gradually towards the uh, 20th century, the effort really goes to uh, from like sailors to the locals. Um, yeah, like, um, I think th there are more things to unpack, and I'm sorry if I <laughs> uh, don't answer this question fully, but um, I think like this a little bit neglected in the current discourse where we see global health is more like a, a salvage, but um, there are some like initial motivations that uh, really came with like a colonial, uh, effort so um yeah <laughs> sorry if i don't cover no. it fully any other questions yes no. uh, who were the initial founders of nuclei who started the network was there a top-down direction from the rockefeller foundation uh so Unfortunately, I don't remember <laughs> the, the, the surname of a scientist, but a scientist at the Colorado State University. Uh, and if you go to the, could you please go to the next slide? And next slide, sorry. So here is the list of the institutions that were participated in a network and they were part of a consortia <coughs> first, but then they, um, yeah, um, became sort of a separate network. Oh, what was the, um, the other part of the question? Um, sorry, I oh, that's um, was the was there a top down direction from the Rockefeller Foundation? Oh, so um, this effort was um, sponsored by uh, MacArthur Foundation, and um, it's they emphasized in their official program document that they, they're grateful for MacArthur Foundation to providing like a free reign, but at the same time, administration that was invisible. So they could um, make um, annual meetings and for the labs provide trainings for new generation of students. They had a summer school and it was all um, sort of covered and <laughs> they were able to do whatever they seem uh, is necessary. No other questions? Laura, do you have any other questions? Uh, no other questions. No? No. no. Okay. Thank you very, very Thank much. You. Um, now we're going to go on because we've changed the order and we'll have Ms. Um, Pola Varman from Creighton University School of Medicine who will present Pandemics in Prisons, a history of decarcerization as disease control. Sorry, just quickly, Joey, can you forward to the next presentation, please? Thank you. Okay. There we go. Thank you. Hi, ready. everyone. My name is Pooja Varman. I'm a third year medical student um, at Creighton University School of Medicine in Omaha, Nebraska. And this presentation is um, about pandemics in prisons, a history of disease control and incarceration. Next slide, please. Um, so I want to start with this, um, this idea from Arundhati Roy from um, last April near the start of the pandemic. She wrote, historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. There's no, this one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. And I think this concept of a pandemic as a portal is... Um, really important, I think, for all of the conversations we're having tonight, but I think in particular when we think about um, how the pandemic has affected marginalized and vulnerable communities and the way the pandemic has unearthed some of the um, darkest inequities um, in our world, especially those in healthcare and in medicine. So 
this is kind of the starting point that I um, want to ground us in in this conversation about um, pandemics in um, in prisons and jails. Next slide, please. So I wanna start with a brief history of pandemics and various strategies for disease control in prisons over the last 200 years. So to begin um, in the 1830s, um, this was kind of the time of um, many different pandemics, but especially in the 19th century, there were at least five different cholera pandemics. So in the 1830s, um, there's reports from the Wakefield House of Corrections in Yorkshire, England, um, where there actually was some decarceration that happened um, during this pandemic in an attempt to um, decrease some of the overcrowding in the um, correctional facility. But for the most part, most prisoners um, who got would just get cholera and then die from cholera. Um, and then um, about four decades later in the 1870s, there are um, reports from a prison in Sri Lanka where they also used incarceration during the um, epidemic as a way to reduce some of the over overcrowding. And um, so during kind of this entire century, there was cholera, dysentery, yellow fever, lots of things that um, affected the entire population, but were particularly nasty in um, correctional facilities. So then moving on to the 1919 or 1918 flu, um, there were studies in um, East, the Eastern State Penitentiary in Philadelphia that showed that actually a really successful approach to disease control in this facility. So they actually enacted a six week quarantine after the first um, case of the flu. They enacted pretty strict policies during this time. They limited prisoner contact between each other. They um, lim uh, barred all visitors from entering the facility. They stopped all gatherings. They had strict sanitation um, as frequently as possible by prison staff. And then there was a strict isolation policy whenever someone would contract the virus, they were um, isolated within the medical unit um, away from the, the rest of the inmates in, in the prison. And this strategy actually was um, very effective in, in 1919 for um, limiting the spread of the flu in within this particular state penitentiary. Um, however, across most other correctional facilities, um, the flu just just kind of wiped a lot of people out. This was kind of an exception to the rule. Then moving on to the 1980s, um, during the HIV and AIDS epidemic, um, there were many facilities um, across the country and the world that, especially due to a lot of the stigma and misunderstanding around how HIV is contracted and transmitted, um, they employed automatic segregation and solitary confinement policies for all people diagnosed with HIV um, and AIDS. And unsurprisingly, this, this did not work um, because HIV operates very differently from the, the rest of the um, uh, viruses and bacteria that are responsible for the other pandemics um, and epidemics um, listed here um, and is not, not an airborne virus. Um, and then in 2009, during H1N1 influenza, there were widespread lockdowns whenever prisoners would contract the virus. There were um, particular reports from San Quentin in California um, showing um, that this policy was widely used in an attempt to control the virus, but really came from, uh, again, a lot of misunderstanding about um, effective strategies for disease control, especially within overcrowded um, settings with um, highly transmissible uh, microorganism. Next slide, please. So now I wanna kind of summarize some of the lessons learned from, from this history um, over the last 200 years. So in the 19th century, um, some of the things especially learned from the cholera pandemic was a lot of information about epidemiology and public health. 
Um, in the beginning of these pandemics, it was not understood widely that cholera is a waterborne disease. And so, so many people were infected and killed by cholera without us having a, um, a proper understanding about how the disease um, functions and is transmitted. But then once there were more advancements in our understanding and our understanding of germ theory, a lot of that which was um, articulated by Dr. Um, Robert Koch, a German um, physician, that kind of uh, propelled um, a lot of advancements in kind of disease control, including a lot of sanitary reforms, um, including changes to the water supply and sanitation um, within the facility itself. Um, that was really unheard of in prison settings. They were usually not regarded um, as a place that needed to be cleaned very much because um, that's where that's where criminals go and they didn't think very much about that. Additionally, understanding how, um, especially with airborne illnesses, that overcrowding inmates into one large room was a very easy way to spread disease very quickly. Um, there were changes in architecture of prisons and jails, so building of separate cells to house inmates um, and other things contribute to a stricter control of um, disease transmission um, uh, kind of during and after this time. Then looking at lessons learned from the 1919 influenza, um, especially from the work done um, in that Eastern State Penitentiary in Pennsylvania, that quarantine and isolation methods really do work um, and that kind of staying in front of the spread of disease um, was an effective way to, um, to prevent unnecessary deaths. And then the 1980s with the um, HIV and AIDS epidemic, there were a lot of lessons about um, kind of some of the cultural ideas around um, viruses and especially sexually transmitted ones like HIV and that solitary, automatic solitary confinement of people living with HIV served more to propagate discrimination and stigma than um, it actually worked for disease control. Additionally, it actually kept people incarcerated for longer periods of time because they would stay um, kind of in solitary confinement beyond their um, date of release. And then during the H1N1 influenza, um, there was more information coming out from the CDC that um, instead of widespread lockdowns, um, there should be areas specifically for sick persons that are designated within jails and prisons. So kind of a more um, evidence-based approach um, to disease control um, during that, uh, that pandemic. Next slide, please. So now I just wanna talk about um, some of the standard strategies for disease control. And we're very familiar with this now as we have um, almost a full year of this pandemic under our belt. So this includes hand hygiene, personal protective equipment, also called PPE, sharps, patient care equipment, housing, patient hygiene, laundry, housing and sanitation, patient transport and access to medical care. And these are things that a lot of us um, on the outside in the free world um, probably take for granted um, because a lot of these things, maybe with the exception of um, PPE, which I think in the in the beginning it was maybe hard to get things like masks um, and N95s, but um, a lot of these things we might take for granted. Um, next slide. Um, but I just want to highlight um, some of the challenges, particularly with. Um, the five items that I've highlighted on this list and how difficult it is to actually achieve and employ these strategies in a correctional facility setting. So for example, hand hygiene, um, due to limited access to um, soap, due to the fact that alcohol-based hand sanitizers are banned in most uh, jails and prisons, hand hygiene is actually very difficult to achieve. Um, while incarcerated, PPE is very limited. Um, housing, um, single unit housing um, kind of out on the outside is a lot easier to achieve, but in places such as homeless shelters and in jails and prisons, um, most people are sharing space in ways that are severely incompatible with social distancing regulations. Um, and it's very difficult to quarantine and, and self-isolate um, if you're worried about infection. 
Next with housekeeping and sanitation, um, it is the kind of the practices around housekeeping and sanitation are not as stringent in these settings as they are in other places that we might be operating. And access to medical care can be very, very limited um, with prison guards often being able to gatekeep when um, inmates are able to access medical care. And um, sometimes the requirement to have certain symptoms uh, in order to access medical care. And this is not very helpful when we have um, a virus that we know is transmitted um, while someone is asymptomatic. So there's a lot of problems in this particular setting um, to be able to actually use these strategies effectively. Next slide, please. Um, now I just kind of want to pause for a moment and consider some of these terms kind of in this arena of um, pandemics and prisons um, and disease control. So just reading this list, disease control, public health, containment, quarantine, isolation, social distancing, solitary confinement, reform, decarceration, and prison That's abolition. Common. Two minutes to go. Okay, thank you. Um, so some of these terms um, kind of run together a little bit. So things like solitary confinement and self-isolation can feel very similar, but it has a very different thing when you are incarcerated and when you are living free. So if I were to get sick and needed to self-isolate, that is a very different feeling than solitary confinement, which is in, um, involved with significant psychological trauma that might be effective in disease control, but is very, 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 very damaging in other ways. So kind of thinking about the significance of containment um, in an incarcerated setting and a non-incarcerated setting, I think is really important. Next slide, please. So these are some broad categories that I kind of thought about um, in thinking about disease control, kind of going from one end of the spectrum of very punitive strategies and one end of the spectrum of more abolitionist strategies and kind of in the middle with reformist strategies. Next slide, please. With some of those punitive strategies kind of disguising punishment as disease control. So things like solitary confinement and medical isolation, as well as widespread lockdown, um, actually end up serving kind of as punishments to people who get sick and is not kind of based in any sense of compassionate care or evidence-based necessarily. And so there's a lot of reports right now of people in prisons with strict solitary confinement policies where um, inmates will, um, will avoid reporting symptoms because they know they'll be thrown into some kind of solitary environment if they report symptoms. So this is not really conducive for broader disease control strategies. Next slide, please. Reformists are kind of um, strategies that we're more familiar with. So these are things like prevention, identification, and management, passing out free soap, closing down gatherings within prisons, things like closing off visitors. Next slide, please. And then I kind of want to spend the last minute just kind of talking about decarceration kind of as a major abolitionist um, and evidence-based approach to disease control. So epidemiologist, Dr. Josiah Rich says, um, the more people behind bars, the more transmissions you're going to have. So this is actually quite simple. Um, next slide, please. Thinking oh, about if we can, what was that? You're out of time, oh. but you can take okay. a minute. Okay, this is my last slide. Um, take, so, take. Go ahead, yeah. Just thinking about uh, when overcrowding is kind of the biggest problems of disease transmission within the carceral setting, reducing the number of people in that setting is the most effective way to, to reduce disease transmission. So broad categories, using any method possible to release people um, as sooner, sooner than later. And I've listed out some different metrics for how that can be done. Reducing bail to zero dollars keeps people out of prison and jail. And then reducing the number of arrests by the police is another way to keep people um, out of uh, incarceration. Next slide, I think I'm done. Yeah. I think we have time for at least one or two questions. Laura, do you have any questions? In the yes, we have a few questions that have come in. Please. Are there examples of modern prisons using best practices informed by both history and science that can serve as a model? Um, I actually was able to find a lot of jails and prisons around the country that have employed a kind of decarceral model during this pandemic. And a lot of this, I think, has been a combination of a lot of the grassroots movements to um, 
abolish prisons and abolish the police, as well as kind of more top down um, evidence based recommendations. So even former Attorney General um, Bill Barr recommended a severe um, cut cut in the number of people who are incarcerated and many um, many people at various levels um, in the government and in the legal system have recommended this. So it um, there's actually a lot of evidence of people who are of facilities that are doing this. And are there prison subpopulations that suffer more than others? How are prisoners segregated today? And does that seem safer than say the early part of the last century? So um, definitely given the fact that there are a lot of um, people who are older, have less access to medical care and have a lot of other comor comorbidities, including HIV, hepatitis B and hepatitis C um, and other like chronic illnesses and disabilities. I think this is a group of people who at a baseline might be sicker and also have less access to medical care and can be older and have less, less access to resources. I think that there are many subpopulations in prisons that are more, more, more vulnerable to getting COVID in general, and especially now that they're incarcerated. Great. And, uh, one last question. Several of the issues you discuss impinge on crucial ar architectural theories. Do you see a collaboration between architects and public health specialists? Um, I do. I think that it is a little bit tricky to talk about architectural reform and prisons because I think this is a, a big debate between prison reform and prison abolition, where in prison reform, they, it, the architectural reform kind of fits into that, but abolitionists would say that we don't necessarily want to be funneling more money into building nicer and fancier and bigger prisons, that that's not actually working towards an end goal of liberation. And so I think there's definitely possibility there, but it be, needs to be done very consciously. Thank you very much. That was really excellent, uh, Ms. Varman, and looking forward to hearing from you again. Uh, you. Now we will proceed to our last speaker, Dr. Nile Yo, uh, graduate from Yale in 2018 with a bachelor's degree in history, science, medicine, and public health, a current third year medical student at the University of Toledo College of Medicine and Life Sciences, and incoming MPH student at Columbia Mailman School of Public Health will be presenting Underserve or Underutilized? Question mark, a Brief History of Mental Health and Psychiatry in Chinese Medical History. Uh, please, yeah, Ms. No. Hi, can you guys see me and hear me? Yes, yeah. I can at least. <laughs> Thank you so much for the very kind introduction. Um, so yes, my name is Neely and I'm gonna be talking about this topic today. Um, you can go to the next slide. So before I kind of delve into the history, I wanna kind of give you an overview of the state of Asian, Asian American mental health today. And I'm gonna do this through two publications, um, one in 2007 and one in 2020. So the first one um, kind of analyzed um, Asian Americans against the general population to see what percentage of each sought mental health services. And they found that uh, significantly less percentage of Asian Americans sought any help from mental health services versus the general population. They also found, interestingly enough, that the use of mental health services differed according to where the individuals were born. So this was like people who were born in the United States versus immigrants. And then they also looked at second and third generation individuals. And they found that individuals who were born in the US sought mental health services at a higher rate than immigrants. And they found that second generation uh, individuals were more similar to immigrants in their behavior and third generation individuals were more similar to the general population. Now, fast forward to last year in 2020, next slide, where um, uh, Yang et al did a study that kind of uh, showed the same result of Asian Americans who need mental health access care at a lower rate um, compared to whites, um, but they also talked more about the kind of barriers that um, Asian Americans kind of said prevented them from getting treatment. This included things like not actually knowing where to go to for treatment, as well as cultural barriers such as stigma, this idea of losing face, um, and culturally unresponsive services. This could mean not having a language interpreter, um, not having a physician or a therapist who looks like you and can relate to you, um, as well as 
things like cost and a lack of entrance covering the services. So next slide. So kind of with that overview, I want to talk about um, what, of the Asian mental health today, I want to talk about the history part of my presentation. And I kind of got interested in this topic because I always heard this thing from my friends and my family of, you know, this idea that Asians don't talk about their feelings or like we don't talk about our emotions or that mental health is not something that exists in like Asian thinking or Asian culture. And I've always heard of similar statements of like Asians are static. Um, they're kind of resistant to change, very traditional. So with all these kind of questions in mind, I really wanted to kind of seek, you know, are there examples of like emotions and health being mentioned in classical Chinese texts? Um, this idea of Confucian morality and if that plays any part um, of how people view the mentally ill in the past and as well as um, kind of how modern day psychiatry was brought to China through missionary work. So this is an outline of my presentation. You can go to the next slide. So my first topic is gonna to be emotions and sickness in classical medical Chinese thought. And interestingly enough, um, this is probably the earliest mention of emotions in Chinese medical texts. It comes from the inner canon and it talks about um, these things called the five intents. And there are these five emotions uh, that are mentioned that have this kind of direct correlation to various organs in our body. Um, and basically the canon says that if any of the five emotions reaches like an extreme state, the corresponding organ can also be injured as well. So for example, anger will injure the liver, joy can injure the heart, pensiveness can injure the spleen, sorrow injures the lung, and fear injures the kidney. Next slide. And we also have this idea of qi that's mentioned a lot in um, ancient Chinese medical texts. And the relationship between qi and the five intents and the effect on health um, is very fluid. So for example, anger can make qi ascend, joy can relax it, exhaustion can consume it, pensiveness can congeal it. So it's very fluid, the kind of relationships that all of these have together. Next slide. Um, and um, I really like this example as well because it talks about like specific symptoms someone can have um, if an imbalance occurs. So example, um, an accumulation of qi caused by emotions may, may result in illness. When they occur, it is so painful that one is unable to eat and even feels like dying. Um, so I thought that was really interesting because they explicitly state what might happen to you if you know one of these imba imbalances occurred. So you can go to the next slide. So um, this is a really interesting case and I'm gonna kind of present it as like a patient case would uh, since I'm a medical student. Um, so this is a patient of a very famous Chinese physician um, so this young woman comes in, uh, pertinent past social history is that she had a fiance, said he loved her and then proposed to her and then went missing for five years. And so as a result, her symptoms were she had loss of appetite, she was really fatigued, and she supposedly laid in bed facing north all day for half a year. When the doctor came in to examine her, he found that her liver pulse was string-like and over the top of her left wrist. And to him, this was sign, these were signs indicative of a congealed chi in the spleen. And according to the way he was thought and what we talked about earlier, um, his differential was, this was due to wanting a man but not being able to get one, also known as love sickness or unrequited yearning. And for him, he knew that, ah, this is pensiveness. This is what's injuring her spleen and causing her illness. And therefore the plan for her is that he had to restrain pensiveness with anger, which was kind of like, I guess, akin to the opposite emotion and to kind of get rid of her symptoms entirely, he had to instill joy within her. So what he did was he kind of teamed up with her father and he goes into the patient room and he just slaps her like three times across the face, makes her super angry, accuses her of having all these salacious affairs. She gets really mad, starts crying and she supposedly kind of um, gets all of her anger out at, at him. And then afterwards, she asks for food for the first time in a really long time. And she starts to you know, gain back her emotion and her strength. And the doctor and the father team up to basically lie to her and say, you know what? No, your fiance is coming. He'll be here soon. You know, just hang in there. And she steadily improves. And three months later, not sure if it is the same fiance, but a fiance does come back. And she supposedly just gets better entirely. Um, so this is actually a really famous case. Uh, it's mentioned in a lot of Ming uh, medical works. But I really like it because I think it's a really interesting 
um, early case of, of psychiatry in Chinese medical history. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, so kind of moving away from that topic, um, I wanna talk more about this idea of how confusion kind of plays within this realm of mental health. So in traditional Chinese society, the insane were not neglected or underserved, but they were rather beneficiaries of a Confucian morality and virtue. And what that means was that the insane were kept within the care of the family. And the family kind of felt these pressures of, you know, filial pi uh, piety, social harmony, and mutual aid to kind of take care of these people and their family. And there's actually a term known for this, and it's called the kinship, can, kinship clan obligation. And it meant that, um, you know, the family would take care of the insane, and if they weren't able to do so, um, they would lose face, and they would encounter really intense feelings of social embarrassment, status, and shame, because they weren't able to kind of contain this issue within their family. Um, and evidence for this practice is that for a really, really long time, China never created its own asi uh, asylum system. Um, it kind of relied on these norms instead. But as we're going to see in the next slide, this approach is going to wane kind of um, in the 18th century when social changes started happening. Great, thank you. Uh, so before I talk about that, um, I want to introduce this term of social technology. It's this concept of society solving uh, and being the ones responsible for social problems within an institutional setting. So it moves away from this family kinship idea that's uh, been longstanding in China's history. And the location I want to talk about specifically is modern day Guangzhou, uh, which back then was called Canton, and it's in the southern part of China. And in the late Qing um, era, they undergo this really rapid social change, mainly caused by um, lots of corruption in the government, would let, which led to um, waning of imperial powers. There was a lot of foreign um, influence on the area at the time because of Guangzhou's uh, location at the port city. Um, so all of these factors kind of came together and made the region a little bit more open to foreign influences. Um, and when we talk about Dr. John Kerr, we're gonna see that um, this region became more open to this idea of uh, a psychiatric space um, of the Western model um, and kind of moved away from thinking that the family had to adhere to this kind of kin kinship clan obligation. Um, so Dr. John Kerr, um, he was a graduate um, of a US medical school and he actually in a chance uh, meeting met a Chinese national who convinced him that he needed to become a foreign missionary in China. And so what he did was he signed with the American Presbyterian Board of Foreign Missions and became their first medical missionary to China. And he got stationed in Canton. And when he arrived to the Canton Medical Hospital, he was kind of blown away by the high number of sane that he found in the space, but there was no space to take care of these people. There was no separate wing of the hospital. They were just kind of there with the rest of the patients. So that's what kind of really prompted his uh, motivation to build what's now known as the Care Refuge, which was the first facility in China dedicated towards the treatment of mental illness. And it was created in 1898, and it actually was um, uh, functioning until 1937. Um, you can go to the next slide. Yeah. So. Um, I really kind of got inspired to make this presentation because of these questions I had earlier or these comments that I kept hearing earlier about how, you know, Asians don't talk about their emotions. Mental health is not something that exists in Asian thinking and that Asians are very traditional. They're not fluid, um, they're static. And when I was kind of putting together this presentation and looking at the research, I thought it was really interesting to see that Actually, there's a lot of mention of emotions and how they can affect health um, in earlier Chinese medical texts. Um, and this idea of uh, the region of modern day Guangzhou kind of being susceptible to foreign influence and kind of uh, allowing for this Western psychiatric space to come and set up shop and kind of help, um, can, uh, have the social change where people moved away from this kinship clan um, idea to uh, more accepting that the insane could go to a place like an asylum, I thought was really interesting. Um, so that's basically my presentation. Um, I'm welcome to any questions and comments, um, but I really, really recommend if you guys are interested in this topic, 
Uh, I have it in my bibliography. It's studies for the Society for the Social History of Medicine, specifically the psych psychiatry and Chinese history chapter. Um, it's where I got a lot of my really fun uh, presentation slides from. So thank you. <laughs> I'll take any questions if there are any. Lauren, we have any questions? Uh, no questions yet. Uh, I have one. What is the status of psychiatry now and what happened to the Kerr refuge? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. Um, so with the opening of the asylum and the care refuge, um, it really kind of kickstarted, I guess, this movement of Western medicine, especially psychiatry in China. Um, and it uh, made people feel more comfortable to allow like their loved ones to go to a place like this. Um, in current day China, mental health is something that is still stigmatized and there is a lot of cultural stigma within it, but um, there are multiple psychiatric hospitals now and um, the, there are mo uh, more models that kind of simulate the ones that we see in the US. Um, so it's still really interesting and a, um, Ch traditional Chinese medicine in China um, still kind of talk about <laughs> like emotions in the way that was kind of seen earlier. So, um, and the, the, um, um, the reference that I talk about has actually really great chapters that talk more about um, how uh, psychiatry kind of accelerated within like the later years. Laura, do you have any questions? Uh, yes, we have a couple of questions. The kinship clan obligation seems to be a value in many different cultures. Mm -hmm. Many immigrant families seem to adopt this approach or understanding to mental health. Are there other specific groups who emphasize in your experience mental health care as part of the family domain? Okay, um, so I can speak from, I'm, so I'm part Chinese, part Malaysian, part Vietnamese. <laughs> um, so from my personal experience and I guess hearing from my friends, um, it's something that is talked about quite often, like this, this idea of losing face. I hear this concept all the time, especially in Chinese culture, um, and especially this feeling of shame. And I think it's more so this reluctance to be vulnerable about one's emotions, um, but also this idea that you have to look perfect all the time. Like you and your family have to put on this kind of um, presentation that you guys are all doing fine, and that includes like your mental health. Um, so at least from experiences that I've seen from my family and from hearing stories from my friends growing up, like no one really of my friends went to like a psychiatrist or a therapist. They kind of, we kind of used our friends as a therapy group, I guess. Um, so I think for certain um, groups, um, it's still kind of an idea in within their family of how it influences the way they think about mental health at least and um, how they're able to kind of feel comfortable reaching out. So I don't know if that answered your question or not. <laughs> we have one more question. Was the resistance to the introduction of a Western psychiatric model in China? Yeah, so I, uh, because there was so much to kind of research for this, um, I unfortunately didn't get to read that much about it because I was worried that I was gonna put too much in the slides. Um, but um, I can definitely, I'm happy to share the bibliography with you because um, there is, like a whole section on how people responded to the introduction of this, you know, Western space into their, um, their homeland. Um, so I'm sorry, I can't speak more to it. I don't want to say anything incorrect, but definitely please read up on that. Um, it's really, really interesting. Thank you. Okay, that it, Laura? That's it. Well, I would like to really thank everybody. And especially I, you know, we have six presentations uh, Half of them were done by senior people and half by students. And I thought that uh, the quality of all of them was superb. Uh, it was a very Catholic small c uh, coverage of many things that pertain today. And I certainly feel very privileged that to be able to have this put together. I'd also like to thank the Academy staff for the Herculean oh, effort sure. of getting everybody's slides on in time, which is scattered higgly piggly over the uh, countryside. And uh, just, you know, we would, uh, we're interesting. This, this could not be nicer. And I'd like to thank you again. And uh, we will be having another one of these next year. And please tune into the Academy programs. And again, there's uh, the new salutation is 
be safe, be well. And again, thank you, all of you, and please thank you, Laura, the Academy staff for doing such a superb job on this this evening. Good night, all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.